Good morning. So, as many of you know, I always prefer to focus on Jesus. Um, and I prefer to preach on the Gospels. But there are some times that I don't. Largely, I refrain from preaching on the Gospels when I am not convinced in my own mind and heart and in my research of people wiser than me and more learned than me, that Jesus said anything like what was written. Sometimes I'll preach on it anyway, talking about why I think Jesus might not have said that. But today, today there is such amazing goodness elsewhere, I can't bear to preach a negative sermon. Because what we have today in this portion of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi is the most poignant and most beautiful thing St. Paul has ever written. Now, I will grant you that many of the things St. Paul has written, I think are personally drek. But this is amazing. This is amazing. <clears throat> let me tell you why it's amazing. And let me tell you why I am amazed. So, <clears throat> quick history lesson. Paul is not writing on the road. He's not writing from a hotel. He's not writing, writing from his home. He's not writing from Rome. He's not writing to the church at Philippi from another church that he planted or that he's visiting. He's writing from prison. He's writing from prison. And this prison, it's not Camp Cupcake, friends. This prison is not a federal or state penitentiary. It is not a county jail. It is an ancient Roman prison. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it was probably a cave with bars attached. And if it wasn't a cave with bars attached, with no bed and no toilet and no recreation yard, and no one to make him any meal of any kind, then it was something like a cave. They used caves when they were convenient. If he was in an actual room, in an actual structure, then it was bare. The room he would be locked in would be completely bare walls, floors, ceiling, bare. And again, there is no one to cook for him. His jailer was there to keep him incarcerated. And there might have been others in there with him. So where did he get paper and pen to write with? Good question. Where did he get food to eat to survive his prison term? Good question. People he knew, friends or family, just like every other jailed person there, would have to provide for him. They would have to bring him food every single day. If he wanted to write a letter to somewhere, they would bring him the supplies. And then they would take the letter away again when he was done. Roman prisons were nothing to sniff at. And there really is no other place on earth, no other prison, even now, even in the worst places, that can compare to a Roman prison, an ancient Roman prison. So Paul's been thrown in prison and left to rot. He's looking at the end of his life. He knows he could die. He knows he could be tried for charges that are untrue. 
He knows he could be tried for charges that are, shall we say, have a kernel of truth in them, but that are largely trumped up. And he knows that whatever good he's had an opportunity to do in his life, that is coming to an end now. And looking his death straight in the eyes, is he trying to bargain? No. Is he in denial? No. Is he trying to win a chess match with death? No. He's writing to one of his favorite churches who's having some strife, some disagreement. And he's begging them to be happy. Like he is. Now remember, he's in jail. He's going to die. It's not a pretty jail. It's not a comfy jail. There isn't warmth and blankets and food and clothing and occasional showers and recreation and the right to a phone call. There's nothing but incarceration. And this man, this man is writing comforting letters to other people. He says, be happy. Be happy in what you know of God. And I say again, be happy. Let your gentleness be known everywhere. To everyone. God is near. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. It's not worth it. But in everything, everything you need, make your prayers, make your requests, do it with gratitude and a full heart. Let God know what you need, but don't worry about it. And the peace of God, which does not make sense. It's going to be with you. It's going to be your armor. And nothing you can say or do could be better than the peace of God. And finally, God, if there's anything good left in the world, if there's anything that is truthful, if there's anything honorable, if there's justice anywhere, if anything is just so pure, if there's anything pleasant, <laughs> if there's anything commendable and worthy, if there's any excellence left in the world, Think about those things. Focus on those things. Talk about those things. And as to what you do, keep doing the things you've been taught to do. And as we know from his letters and his ministry, Preach the gospel, teach disciples, love your neighbor as yourself. Give money to those who need it. Give food to those who need it. Give clothing to those who need it. Give water to those who need it. That's what they should continue doing. So he says, first of all, be happy. 
Second, don't worry. Third, think about the good things that still exist in this world. Fourth, keep doing what you know you need to do. This he tells a church in the midst of conflict, a church with deep troubles and deep pains. And he doesn't tell them this from a place of someone who has no idea what deep trouble is, has no idea what deep pain and sorrow and disagreements are like. This is the wisdom of someone who is about to die. This is the wisdom of someone who is in great turmoil. And so we can imagine that this is also his advice to himself. Don't worry. Be happy. Focus on the good things and keep doing what you know you need to do. Amen.